Okay, brilliant. Um, so welcome everybody. Welcome to um the seventh open lecture session by, by Quiro class. Um, today we have a very special guest and a, and an old friend of mine from uh, uh from uh, who graduated from MIT. This is Nacho. He's an educator and an educational technologist. After graduating from MIT, he went on to co-found a company called Valfi, which was an educational technology tool that would use AI to help students reduce their public speaking anxiety by learning how to mimic their role models. This technology received grant funding from MIT's Integrated Learning Initiative. Nacho now teaches physics, free calculus, and AI applications at, a, at the Sojour Truth Public Charter Montessori School in Washington, D.C., while doing independent research on AI-assisted uh, observational learning. And there's, there's a lot more to him, and I'm sure you'll find out about him as we go. And please feel free to ask questions um, at the end of, uh, of, the, of the session. And yeah, let's keep it as informal as possible. And over, over to you, Nasha. Awesome. Well, thank you for that great introduction. And, and thank you, everyone who showed up today, and also those that will be listening to the recording a little later, because I know some people just couldn't make it. But because we have a small group, what I'm going to do is really informally talk about my story post-college, talk about the startup story, and hopefully go a little more in depth into the data we were looking at to build the product, the market we were looking at, and just some of those details, because I know this group has ambitions in data science and potentially startup technologies and things like that. Um, so hopefully I can go into some of those details and, and get some good questions around those. And then ultimately when I'm done with that story, hopefully we could just have a conversation about what people in this group want to do, what are the ambitions here, see where I can help. Um, again, since we have a small group, we can kind of open it up to that and see where I can maybe connect you all with people or help out with certain projects. Part of the independent research part of that introduction is just helping out in educational projects that I think are meaningful and impactful like this one. So very excited to be here. And so to get started, in if we go back to 2020, so 2020 was when the pandemic set off. Um, I was at MIT and we just found out that we had to be sent home because the pandemic was, was, it, was what it was, right? And so at MIT, I always knew I wanted to start a company, but with the sudden removal from campus and figuring out, you know, finding a job right after school, I didn't really get that opportunity to do that right after school. So I actually worked in economic consulting right after college. And for those of you that are in the data science space, I would say economic consulting is very much data. We're working with clients such as companies, financial institutions, law firms to help them look at data and better strategize how to target legal cases, how to win legal cases. Obviously, that wasn't what I was passionate about doing. Like I said, I wanted to start a company. Um, but that was a good intermediate thing to do because it showed me what skills I'm good at. It showed me what things I don't like to do. And what I did learn from that experience is I really do like looking at data for qualitative outcomes. So not just coding an app to crunch numbers, but actually looking at data, both qualitative and quantitative. So for, for definitions and reference, quantitative is more like numbers. Qualitative is more looking at, let's say, scripts from a call or scripts from a meeting and seeing how people are behaving or talking. Economic consulting allowed me to do both of those at the same time. And I really like to find the intersection between the qualitative and the quantitative. So how can we look at patterns in our behaviors, patterns in what we say to predict outcomes, to inform strategy? So I, I quit that job after a year. The, the startup bug was a little too big in me. And so I quit that job after a year looking to start something in the educational technology space. And at MIT, so at MIT, I was class president. I also started a business club and was very passionate about public speaking. And when I was thinking about, okay, what is the intersection between the qualitative and the quantitative, public speaking was actually something that really, really interested me because a lot of the methods towards solving for public speaking. So thinking about how can we practice more of our speech? How can we get feedback? A lot of those methods were very 
qualitative and we're very not strategic, right? A lot of people struggle with public speaking, but we're telling them to go practice in front of a lot of people and they're not going to do that practice. So they'll never get better. So there were a lot of issues in public speaking education that seemed pretty interesting to me, but ultimately I was just interested in the education sector as a whole. And that's what led to my collaboration with Learn With Leaders and the founders of there, just to start talking to them about their programs. And as I learned that there are so many programs, debate programs, there was design programs, some programs they even wanted me to create. A lot of these programs had public speaking and communication at their foundation. So whether you're going to debate, whether you're going to pitch a company or an idea, you're going to have to speak to people. And Learn With Leaders didn't even themselves have a sustainable, scalable way to help all of their students with public speaking. So that's a lot of how I became introduced to that problem that Valfi ended up trying to solve. Um, and that comes to my first point of instruction slash learning for everyone here is that it's very easy, especially in college or a little bit past college to start thinking about what is a great idea? Like, I wanna come up with the next idea. I wanna come up with the next idea. And that can often be useful, but what I would recommend is really coming up with what is that problem that really hasn't been solved in a way that you're satisfied with, in a way that you see society is satisfied with. Public speaking was one of those problems for me and, and that's what led me to that insight. So started collaborating with Learn With Leaders led a few programs, served as associate dean for some time for uh, the Design Thinking Fellowship or Take the World Forward Fellowship, my apologies. And just got to interact with a lot of students, do a lot of programs. We did a public speaking program where we would go on Zoom. We would have a ton of prompts and students would respond to them. I would give them feedback. And so I just started to understand the problem from a very real lens, right? When we talk about defining a problem that you want to solve using data, using whatever, you want to make sure you solve that problem. You, you understand that problem in a very real lens. So I was putting myself in front of students, hearing them speak, talking to them about their anxieties, and making sure that whatever technology I built is based on the real psychology that I've seen from these students. Okay. So, you know, after I got a, a big understanding of what needs to happen to solve this problem, I presented a potential solution to the Learn With Leaders team, and we collaborated and decided to start a company, and that's how Valfi was formed. And so now I'm going to just go into a little more detail in terms of what exactly Valfi is, what is the data that we're looking at, we're looking at, right? So when we talk about AI, everyone's like, let's make AI, let's make AI, let's make AI. It's really based on what data are you looking at? So the data piece is so critical to the Valfi solution and to any AI solution. For those of you that want to start AI companies or build anything in AI, the first step is choosing the best data, um, choosing data that's unbiased, choosing data that's representative, choosing the best data that actually will solve your problem. And then talking about productizing that data, right? So you can build a great technology, but if you can't build a good product, a product that people will will like a product that people can understand that's simple enough for a user to use. People won't use your technology and it will never actually solve the problem. So the second piece I'm going to talk about is how did we productize it? How did we think about the user and all of that? And then finally, like what happened with it, right? So Valfi wasn't in a traditional sense, a success story from a startup perspective, right? When we think about startup success stories, we think about they raised 10 million and eventually they IPO and eventually the company was sold and all of that. Valfi wasn't that story. Uh, we did receive a pretty exclusive, very impressive grant from MIT, but ultimately it wasn't a successful startup story. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So before I continue, are there any questions from the group? You can also put questions in the chat as well. Um, and I will just stop and answer your questions. I think if I'm just going and going and people have questions, it's better for you to just put those questions in the chat and then we'll do a formal Q&A after, but make sure you put questions in the chat if you have them. So the first part of what I was said I was gonna discuss is the data piece. So, sorry, is there a question? Oh, okay, you just unmuted for a second, you're all good. So the data piece, right? So thinking about 
what data did we use to try and solve the problem of public speaking and public speaking anxiety, right? So the first piece of it is speech data, right? You need to have some sort of speech data. And we looked at other apps that were doing it and a lot of other apps would take just speech data of their students speaking, right? Taking speech data of their users speaking. Um, there were some apps that will give you automatic feedback, which is in educational theory, very, very important to be able to give people immediate feedback. But the problem with that was, again, if the issue is not necessarily just public speaking, but public speaking anxiety, I don't wanna practice, I don't want to put myself out there because I'm scared. Um, there needs to be a little more nuance to the solution and a little more nuance to thinking about what data we want. And it can't just be, we'll create an app that gives feedback, collect data from those users, and then use that to better the feedback, better the experience. We actually had to have some sort of data set that had speech data that would be useful to users and also make the product something that's attractive to users. And so one thing I was thinking of was there is a ton of speech data on YouTube, right? And we live in a world where, especially when you're in the qualitative fields, there's actually a lot of very available free data that you can find on YouTube and other data sources. And so I'm like, there's a ton of speech data on YouTube based on who's a good speaker, right? There are many TED Talks, there are many business presentations, many things on YouTube that show what good speech is, right? And so this is educational content. And I'm sure some of you, maybe when you had a speech, might have gone online and looked up a good speech and tried to see what you can learn from that. But most of you probably have not done that. And if you look at a lot of just psychology research, observational learning is an extremely powerful tool for learning. So if you don't know how to speak well, one of the smartest things to do is go and look at good speakers, right? If you think about how we learn how to speak in general, right? We learn from whoever was raising us. We, we copied their patterns. We heard their language. Um, and so it was, there's, there's this whole gold mine of, of good public speaking data that's available to everyone, whether you're in, whether you're in Delhi, whether you're in the United States, th this data is available to anyone, but it's not really being used, right? Like some people watch TED talks and you watch a TED talk and you're like, oh, this is a great speech, but what exactly are you extracting from it? Do you understand why it's a good speech? Can you actually replicate why it's a good speech and get feedback while you're doing that? And so that was really where I felt like the gold mine was, right? There's a whole data set that people are just not using, but theory <laughs> says is very, very important. And so that's kind of the learning from that piece of thinking about what data am I looking at when you want to create something innovative, when you want to solve a problem in a different way, part of that solving a problem in a different way is looking at what data might be overlooked, what data might not be being used in the way that it really could and, and not up to its full potential. All right, so that was the data that interested me. Uh, one fun fact was I actually interacted with this data before even starting Valfi, before interacting with Learn With Leaders, because while I was looking for outside work when I was economic consulting, as I was trying to explore what a startup might look like, I started my own small company coaching some professors on public speaking. And one method I used that was actually very liked was, okay, here's a, here's a speaker on YouTube I found that actually seems like she motivates you, inspires you. I actually asked the professor like who inspires you. And she mentioned a speaker called Danella Meadows and so I went on YouTube, extracted a lot of data on her speech, how, how fast she's speaking, number of filler words, things like that. And then compared it to the professor and said, here is how close you are to that. And, and you can see that from our sessions, you're actually getting closer to that model of speech, which was a pretty cool graph to show her. Um, but also like when I started working with Learn With Leaders, when we started thinking about this idea, it actually was something I was already doing. It was probably subconsciously there, um, but I never really had the opportunity to make it into a technology. So that comes to the next point about productizing it. The, the first piece about productizing an idea is that it does require money. So a large reason why, like I said, I might've had this idea and tried to do it for one professor, it wasn't really scalable, right? 
if if I'm working with 20 people or 30 people, or if I want to do it for students across the world, now we're working with hundreds of students with hundreds of different role models, I can't just crunch the numbers for every single student, right? That's not scalable. Um, and it's also just not sustainable. So this idea really had to be productized, but that took money. So we ended up collaborating with Learn With Leaders. Uh, we ended up having to hire a tech firm as well um, that I was managing. And we had to think about what, what does this look like in product form, right? And so when you're asking yourself that question, the next question to ask is one, what are similar products that exist that are accomplishing a similar function, right? So looking at other public speaking apps, looking at other educational apps in general, then looking at other apps where students or users or whoever is using the app is actually trying to mimic some sort of thing. Right, so the first step is looking at what's available. And a lot of people are like, well, I have a very novel, innovative idea. And so I don't want to look at other things and try and copy it because then it's just gonna look like other things. Um, my pushback to that always is creativity is best within limits and structure. Okay, so make sure that you're actually looking at the landscape because oftentimes the most creative things are just little hacks on something that already exists. Okay, so, so we ended up looking at a ton of products. We had a lot of calls and, and meetings with people and we ended up bringing on advisors and we had potential investors. Uh, some cool people I've talked to, um, CEO of chess.com was really interested in, in what we had to do. Uh, we haven't, he didn't invest, but he referred us to the investors in, in TikTok, which was a really cool kind of interaction. None of them ended up investing, which we'll get to my last point eventually. Um, but just some really cool conversations and we pitched to investors and, and all of that stuff. But core to it was, can you sell this to people? Like, will it make money? Um, and that was a very difficult thing because as we built the product, as we made it pretty, we looked at the user interface, we, we, we needed to make it flow. We needed to make sure it was gamified. So students these days like to learn through games. There were so many considerations to make this core functionality of looking at YouTube data and reduce that anxiety. Uh, the core math and core structure to that was was almost nothing compared to trying to productize it and marketize it. And so that was a difficult thing for me as a first time founder, I'll be very honest with you all, because I think deep down, I am most passionate about solving problems, right? And when you feel like you have a solution, you're like, yes, we've done it. Like this is the solution, I believe in it. There's the research that backs it up, all of that stuff. Um, but then it's like, that's only the starting point, especially if you want to do a startup, you have to think about will people actually buy it, you can have the most brilliant solution in the world, but if people don't care, you will never make money off of it. Right. And so just a lot of those type of considerations, uh, we're, we're, we're making it really difficult to actually productize it. Uh, we went through tons of calls with our developers changing the models get putting it in front of people and students to get feedback and ultimately we spent so much time trying to master the perfect product that we didn't really put it in front of the actual students enough. Like we didn't actually release the technology for almost a year because we were internally trying to get something perfect. And yes, yeah, sure, we put it in front of some students internally, but ultimately for those of you that want to do a startup, you cannot be afraid of putting an unfinished product in front of people because that's the only way you learn that's the only way you get it better and so that was some of my key learnings from from the product side of things and from trying to create that idea and make it into something useful and and something that it can actually be a business uh that was really tough one thing before i go into how the story ended is just being clear on what balfi actually does because i don't know if everyone knows that so you would go on the app you would say my speech role model is this president or this business person, whatever. And we already have extracted data on three particular metrics on that speaker. So how fast they speak, how many filler words they use and how many pauses they use per minute. And so when you're speaking on the app, 
you get compared real time to that role model. So how closely are you to their speech? And the key is not to necessarily make you a better speaker by doing that. I think there's, if we got to really test out the, the app and really put it in front of hundreds of students, I my hypothesis is that you would become more consistent in your speed and more consistent in your pausing, et cetera, which does indicate for better speech. But our key thing was reducing anxiety. So if you're getting this reassurance, this affirmation that you're speaking more like someone who's an established good speaker, the thesis was that whether you're get, becoming a good speaker or not, the key thing is your confidence should be increasing, which will then make you practice, which will then make you become a better speaker in reality. Um, again, none of this was really proven, which is somewhat unfortunate. I think I will definitely want to prove this at some point, but ultimately was not proven, but that was the hypothesis of the technology. And so that was what we were trying to productize. That's what we worked very hard and tirelessly to do. Um, but ultimately, you know, that is what happened. So, so how did it end up, right? What ended up happening was we, we reached a very difficult point where it's like, we believe we have this awesome product, this awesome technology we just built, but we haven't really put it in front of people. Investors are telling us, you know, we, we think this is brilliant, but you haven't shown us any revenue. And getting revenue for this type of product is pretty difficult. You know, you have to, especially something that's new, you know, if it, we were a little ahead of our time. I think if we had released this AI product a little bit later when AI now is kind of at the forefront of a lot of technology conversations, I honestly think it might've been easier to raise, but we were just so ahead of our time in terms of using AI in the educational realm in this way. A lot of people didn't really get it. Uh, I don't think a lot of people saw the immediate value. Um, and so we didn't really hit market successfully. We, we tried to release. Uh, there were still bugs and things like that. After a year, year and a half of working, uh, we released. We weren't really successful. Um, people didn't. I wouldn't say it wasn't successful. It just wasn't successful fast enough for a lot of our founders. Um, and we had already dedicated so much time to it that we would just continue putting more money into something that might not be successful. And so the business side of Valfi started to, to kind of die down a little bit. And at that point, I was like, I don't think, I think this idea is so strong. And I think even if this product isn't going to be a startup, this idea does need to get into the public. This idea is super, super important to think about, not just for speech, but if observational learning, AI assisted can really reduce anxiety in a ton of realms, this is something that we need to be researching in because ultimately there's so much data, there's so much potential observational data that's just sitting there and it could be being used by students across the world to just really level up. And so I decided, you know, and my co-founders didn't really see why I was doing this, but I just decided I'm going to write a research paper explaining why I think this solution is correct. And so I, I, I really grinded and, and wrote that paper and shared it with the MI, shared it with the, the founding team. And they were like, this is awesome. But, you know, again, what do we really do with this right now? We need funding right now. We need money. Um, but luckily I had a former MIT professor of mine that was also an advisor on our team. And I shared the paper with her and she was extremely interested by it. And we started collaborating on making the paper better and making it more clear and more direct. And she just believed in it quite a lot. And from there, you know, we applied for a grant from MIT and we got that at a very cool time. You know, this was one of the, the first grants they were giving around this AI boom. And so, as you can imagine, they were looking for some pretty high level proposals and to get accepted to that was pretty awesome. And that was just money to do the research, to attend conferences. We've also attended a conference at Columbia just presenting the research and it was very well received. And like I said, it's not the traditional, it's not the traditional startup story. Um, it's more so it turned into a research project, right? It's not the traditional startup story. It turned into a research project. Um, and I don't think it was not successful. 
right? Like, I don't think, I don't think just because it wasn't the traditional IPO and exit, it's not successful. Um, but I do think it really changed my perspective on how to think about what exactly is your objective, right? And this is my question I will ask for all of you, you know, with your career, if you're trying to start a company, if you're trying to solve a problem, you know, just be very clear on what is your objective. And for me, my objective was to present a solution to a problem that I thought was really important and, and bring it to the limelight. And, you know, I feel like I did that to an extent. Uh, we were blessed enough to be featured on Forbes and and BBC. We had some cool interviews and being able to go to Columbia to talk about this problem. And, and we got invited to the Gen AI week at MIT. So MIT had created a college of computing and I was one of the first people to actually be in that building and not only be in there, but present. And so for me, when I look back on this, I actually think it was a, a huge success, you know, but from a startup perspective, it might not look like that. And so just thinking about your life and thinking about your ideas and your objectives and your goals and all of that, think about what exactly is your objective, right? Like what, what will make you satisfied? If you're solving a problem, is just solving it satisfying or do you need to start a company on it? Do you want to collaborate with people? Is your, is your goal to eventually work with other bright minds to solve a problem? Um, just be clear on that and like stand on that because you never really know what's going to happen. You never really know what's, how it's going to go. My career so far has been really all over the place. Um, but everything's been with intention and everything's been with a philosophy of I want to make a big difference in education. I want to be a technologist that really pushed our boundaries and pushed our thinkings in education and, and really forced us to look at things outside the box. And so I believe I've done that. And I hope you all, as you're figuring out your philosophies and your goals and your, your motivations, I hope you all are also really thinking about what are problems you want to solve and being realistic with yourselves that the journey might not look like what you expected. But ultimately, if your core foundational philosophies and goals stay rooted, you can find a way to have career fulfillment and success throughout any sort of like storm and any sort of weird thing that life throws at you, because ultimately there are going to be a lot of weird things that happen. So that's really all I have to say about my story. My apologies, I'm a little bit congested, but um, that's really all I have to say about my story. I will say that any questions you have, please feel free to ask. We can make this a conversation, but otherwise, I hope my email will be shared so you can always email me. Anytime I speak to students, like email me for whatever, whether it's a question, whether you just want to do another call and learn more, um, whatever it is, just please email. And, and I'm pretty responsive to that. So thank you for having me. Thank you for hearing my story. And, and let's open it up for questions. That was such an amazing story. Like, Thank you. The way you said it out, like I feel like there's so much success story that it was put out there on media and all of that. And when you hear like the real, real stuff and like how how life works, it's it's a really great story. I think it's an amazing story. I, th I think it's, it was quite successful as well. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, that's that's so true. Like a lot of these stories you see, you just see the headlines, but there's a lot of ugliness behind it that a lot of people won't talk about. So. You know, I'm glad I had this opportunity and thank you for that comment. Mm -hmm. that, that's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Is Valfi available on the Google Play Store or any other platform for us to use? Unfortunately not. So as the business died down, um, the co-founders kind of had the, they had the jurisdiction um, with the app. And so I don't think it's still up. Right, because you kind of have to pay server costs and all of that to keep it up. And because it's not running as a business anymore, it's it's uh, not up. So, yeah.
what do you plan now? Do you want to continue working on it? How do you, how do you think about you know the uh, the future of Alfie? Yeah, so it's it's a little difficult. Um, I would love to see the technology built, right? I don't know if I'm going to be the one that will do it. I think I could see myself hopefully investing in it. Um, but just where I'm at in life at the moment, I don't know if I'll be starting a company like that anytime soon. Um, that being said, like, I'm going to continue doing that research. Um, in any way, I can continue to prove that it's something that could work. I will do it. But yeah, it's it's an interesting spot because I don't know in this moment if I would want to just go and say, you know what, I'm going to go start something again. Um, I want to more solidify myself as a researcher, as a writer, and hopefully invest in a technology similar or other similar technologies at the end of the day. But that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, that's that's way to know. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing, Nasha. That was really interesting. Sorry. Like even with the uh, Quiddle class as well, it's um I, I agree so much that it's you cannot wait for a finished product before you go to your customers. You have to iterate. You have to be able to iterate as much as possible. You have to mess up, and then the customers and the and your clients will tell you that you know you mess up in this way, and then you have to make things better, and then you keep doing that. Yes. Yeah, that's that's hundred percent correct. And you know, with that, right? Like a lot of people take it too far and be like, okay, to start a company, you have to mess up, mess up, mess up, mess up. It's like, if you're not messing up with any sort of purpose, if you're not messing up in learning, then you're just actually messing up and you don't really have a success. So, um, or you don't really have a route to success if you're just messing up. And so you're totally right. You got to put something out that's not finished, but always when you put something out, have some sort of strategy of like, how am I learning from this? So like whatever I put out next is way better. So. Yeah, messing up with with style. Yeah, messing up with style. I like that. Um, well, uh, well Nash, what are you what are you working on these days? So, what's your research? What is the most re uh, latest research that you're working on? Maybe. Yeah, so I'm looking now at a lot of. So I played basketball in college, and so I'm looking at observational learning in sports. So looking at how we can use observational learning methods to train athletes. Um, Still looking at the observational learning in terms of the Valfi application, but more broader, like, okay, if observational learning with technology is something that can be a field. What are the optimal technologies and what situations? Um, those are kind of two major things. I'm also in the process of just trying to find more projects to look at and, and be engaged with. So if there are any students here that are working on projects that are interesting, would love to be a mentor. Um, and yeah, just doing a lot of networking, figuring out my next steps, figuring out who I might want to collaborate with next. Do I want to go get a PhD? Um, a lot of questions, a lot of questions. But right now, I'm being very open minded, I would say. That's brilliant, man. Um, well, if the do does anyone here have any any questions? Yes, please don't please don't be shy, Malika uh, Spandan. Ask away. I think Nashu would be a great help for your applications for like you know for any anything to do with technology. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Spandan. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Nacho. Hi, how's it going? Uh, yeah. It was, it was really good to hear your story. And I have one question for you. Yep. So as you went to the MIT, right? Yes. And about the venture like you opted for while you were there, do you think that you would have been able to opt for the venture if you had gone to a smaller college, not as prestigious as MIT? Um. I would say yes, but that's just because of the person I am, right? I think an MIT caliber person at any school will be successful. Um, and I think there are a lot of people that are 
quote unquote MIT caliber that don't go to MIT, right? Whether it's because of opportunity, whether it's because of financial concerns, like there are a lot of people who are that level um, who don't get that opportunity. So that being said, right? Like did MIT help? 1000%. Um, just with the brand name, especially when you look at startups and look at how do we get the call with the investor, right? Like investors get hundreds of emails saying invest in our startup, invest in our startup. But it's like, who are they going to respond to? And oftentimes, if you have that MIT tag, you're likely to get a response, right? So um, definitely helped. But also, like, it won't save you. Like, if you don't have the execution, if you don't have a good idea, it won't save you. Um, if you look at a lot of the successful founders, like, yeah, a lot of them went to Harvard, MIT, Stanford, but a lot of them really didn't. Um, and even at MIT, I realized that there were a lot of good researchers, but not necessarily a ton of good founders. Uh, being a good founder is a very specific skill set that really has nothing to do with MIT. So, right, right. And I have another question for you. Yeah. If you're interested in it. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, basically, do you think that everybody that gets admitted to prestigious universities like the MIT itself have bright minds like they are the ones that are able to drive society towards a better path they are the able to they are the per, they are the people that are able to bring revolution in the society that we live in do you think that they all have equally bright minds that's an interesting question um I would say that everybody who gets into MIT reaches a certain criteria that the admissions office has. Like it's a combination of scores. It's a combination of what you're saying in your essay. It's, it's all of that stuff. Um, I would have to imagine to get to that point, you would have to be quite bright. So again, like I think there's a baseline level of brightness. Now to the second point of your question, like, is everyone equally able to go and be, you know, change the world and do all that stuff? First of all, like not every from everyone from MIT has the ambition to do that. And that's not a bad thing, right? Like some people just want to do really well at, at school and get a job that pays a decent bit and then live a normal life, right? Like, I think there's this misconception that just because you went to MIT, you're trying to solve the next big problem or like, create the next big company, that's just not the case. And it, and it really shouldn't be the case, right? Like if that's not your personality, then you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, so no, not everyone is equally able and equally wants to do that big revolutionary idea, problem solving, et cetera. Like the reality is that's just not the case for any school, any top institution. Um, Everybody is different and we all have different roles that we're gonna play in society and so it's the same thing at MIT. I get it. I get it. Yeah. How did you get into data analysis? Could you share uh, where where should one start? Uh, yes. So I actually majored in. So it's technically a business major at MIT, but it's like a quantitative analysis business major. So did a lot of that in in college. So this asked my major. Um, and I just kind of always loved data. Like I, I've always loved the concept of, okay, there's this big societal problem. We can debate and discuss it all day, or we can look at the data and figure out, are there some like actual solid statements we can make that get us closer to an answer? So just the way my mind works was very conducive to falling in love with data and thinking about data. So, and I guess the, the where one should start, I would just say like, start with a project. Like think about like a project that would require you to collect data, to clean the data, to analyze the data, and then to produce something on that data, whether it's like a,
as you progress with that project, you're going to, as you progress with that project, right? What's going to happen is you're going to start learning different pieces of things you need for the project, but the core project is actually keeping you motivated, right? One thing we don't talk about enough in, learn in learning psychology is consistent motivation, right? Like someone can give you an awesome tool to like learn data analysis. You can go on Khan Academy and learn data analysis all day, but like, will someone be motivated to sit down and do that? And is that even the quickest way to learn? Versus saying, oh, I'm going to make a data science project on this subject that I'm already passionate about. Here are all the things I need to learn to actually pull this off. And now you're motivated to pull it off because you know when you pull it off, you're actually going to be able to create something tangible that you can put in the portfolio, that you can show your professors, that you can potentially spit into a startup. You know that that learning is actually leading to an outcome that you care about. And so the difficulty of learning has more motivation to it. So I would say the best starting point is thinking about what's a project that you would actually be passionate about and then learning the data analysis tools needed to, to fulfill that passion. Okay, if, if uh, nobody else has any questions. Anyone? Okay, fine. So let me just um, thank you, Nasha. Thank you for that brilliant talk. I think it's it's absolutely incredible to be able to talk about um, things that you know that aren't like necessarily like oh yeah you know it's a it doesn't work out in 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 one way. But then the amount of teaching that it, it tells everybody that's uh, that's that's incredible, right? Um, just because it's not a, a not a not on the app store anymore doesn't mean that it wasn't. Uh, you know, successful. I think it, it taught me a lot when I was working on that project. I think it was quite brilliant how the way you manage that team, uh, man. And yeah, uh, absolutely inspired by you as a as a tutor, as a teacher, as a public speaker. I really looked up to you back in the day, and I still do. And yeah, well, thank you, thank you, Najee, for coming in, and thank you all the students for coming in as well. Let me just uh, quickly walk everybody through Guido class, what we do, what we've been up to, uh, and then we'll end the session there. So this is our website, guidoclass.com. Um, 1,200 mail. Oh, okay. We'll get to that. Um, yeah, so we have a guided research program at Guido Class where you're free to send in your research abstract, your research proposals to us. Um, you can send us your proposals or set up a meeting with me to uh, ask me about how these proposals work. Uh, once you send us a proposal to our email address, library at guidoclass.com, we'll assign you a mentor, either in computer science or economics or uh, political science. We have people in international relations um, to help you sort of figure out how do you start writing your own research papers, right? Uh, where do you do the research? How do you start to understand some of the papers that you might be having trouble reading? How do you cite a paper properly? How do you uh, make sure there's no plagiarism in your paper? Um, and all of that, and we help you submit it to a journal, either a high school journal, if you are uh, uh, currently a high school student or a gap year student, uh, or to a, a more senior journal if you are in your undergraduate degree or, or beyond that. Uh, we also have open lectures, uh, which Nacho was currently uh, a part of. We've had people from um, my own college, Ashoka University, uh, my professor, uh, my own professor, Professor Bittu, who studied neuroscience at Harvard. We had other, other mentors from Aquido class speak as well, from the Harvard Medical School. We had people from, um, uh, well, all over the place. We had um, multiple people from Harvard. We had people from the Cancer Research Center in Glasgow. Um, and we'll keep doing a few more of these. So if you're not signed up for our open lectures already, just make sure that you are. We have a reading circle as well, where we share readings with uh, all of our students on our Google Classroom. So make sure you're registered for these, for uh, for any of these like free open access sessions. If you are working on your college applications, um, our mentors also do help with that. Once you sign up, you are free to log in to our, our sort of uh, members area and explore that, where you can set up meetings with uh, a number of our mentors. We have uh, from, again, from Harvard, from Cornell, from Oxford, um, we have people from the Wharton School, most recently Vivek Jaju, who's also going to be doing an open lecture next week. So hopefully we'll see you for that as well. 
um, yeah, and then just a step by step on how do you complete your college applications? How do you select your colleges? How should your CV look? Um, you know, what are some things to think about when you're writing your application essays? And we also help you edit these essays before you send them across to your university. So whenever you uh, sort of like click on these meeting links, you'll be prompted to set a time with our mentors. Uh, and yeah, we, we have a few more programs, a guided research program in machine learning. That's with Ishan Mishra, from who is from uh, Sunny University in Buffalo. Uh, he's a research assistant there. He's also studied uh, a PhD from Indian Institute of Technology. This program's already begun. I think Malika is a part of that uh, session um, and a few more students here as well. Um, yeah, and so people here are working on one research project under Ishan and they're going to be co-publishing that paper three months down the line in a good journal. And this is sort of a competitive uh, intake. We only take in a few students, um, but then we'll have multiple more of these sort of programs coming up. And if you're giving your GREs or any such um, sort of tests, we also have sections for that. We have people with multiple years of experience teaching GRE and we're going to be having SATs and IELTS classes soon. So if, if you are interested in that, that's also something that you could look into at our website. So yeah, so guided research, uh, your college applications, your test preps, uh, and a series of certificate programs with the most qualified mentors. Um, they're all on our website. So do check us out, follow us on Instagram. And yeah, that's that's about Guido Plus. Um, thank you, Nasha, once again for coming in. And thank you, every buddy else for, for being here to hear us out as well. If, yep, uh, thank you all. Uh, one last thing, if you could send me that recording when you have it, let me know. And then also anybody who wants to, again, writing papers, applications, anything, and you want to send it my way, um, I can put my email in the chat and then I'm sure you can also share it with the greater membership. But really don't hesitate to reach out whether you want to have a conversation, you're trying to determine what to do next in your your life, your career, whatever, please don't hesitate to reach out. Love having those conversations. Okay, um, I'll send this email to everybody who's attended as well. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Nacho, once again for, for being here. Maybe we can catch up sometime soon and uh, uh, plan something out with uh, with Kuiro class in the future as well. Yep, let's meet up soon. Let's do yeah. it. Brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.